Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is a new program for graphic design with author David Reinfurt, and I'm Li Shan Huang, Design Education Manager here at AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. All right. Well, let's kick things off. Also, want to point out that David's book, A New Program for Graphic Design, is published by Inventory Press with art book. DAP. You can get 25% off the book and other books at artbook.com. Just use the code AIGA member 25. Anybody who has used a MetroCard machine in New York City has seen his work. He's one of the designers of the touchscreen interface for the New York City subway system. David Reinfurt is an independent graphic designer who works in a number of different arrangements, different brands or organizational structures. He works under three monikers, ORG, Dexter Sinister, and The Serving Library. He's a graduate of Yale and teaches at Princeton University. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to David now, who will give a presentation from his book, and then I'll come back and do some Q&A. See you in a bit. Thank you, Lee Sean. And thank you to the IGA and thank you to DAP for arranging this and for it to Inventory Press as well. I'll talk for about a half an hour and then I think Lee Sean will come back on and we're going to um, have some questions. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about this book, A New Program for Graphic Design. It was published by Inventory Press with DAP in 2019. About 10 years before, uh, before it was published, I was invited by Joe Scanlon, the director of the visual arts program at Princeton University, to create a course in graphic design. Um, it would be the first class at Princeton. Um, and uh, it ran into a little bit of difficulty, I understand, when, trying, when he was trying to get it approved. Um, the university replied, well, we we don't we don't know about graphic design. You know, we don't teach that. We're not a trade school. But he managed to convince them that it was a broad skill um, that deserved to be offered among everything else in the art program and undergraduate curriculum in general. Um, Princeton University is a um, is a specific place which is uh, overwhelmingly undergraduate, and it's a very small campus. Uh, there are not the graduate and professional schools that uh, often exist at other universities, like a business school or a law school or a medical school. Instead, it's focused on undergraduate liberal arts education. Um, and when I was invited in to develop a course, I thought it was good to consider graphic design as a kind of liberal art. And so what I mean is, is a tool or body knowledge to learn about in order to think about other things. And this made a lot of sense to me since graphic design has no real subject matter of its own. Um, and it is always, it's kind of, it's a method applied to another body of knowledge. Um, the first class that I developed at Princeton was uh, typography, a kind of root level root level skill in graphic design uh, that was followed over the years by gestalt or a class in visual form kind of everything that's not letters i guess and then a third class which was an advanced class which was called interface and that was based around computer interfaces which i just thought were important enough to at this moment to um, constitute a separate class uh, these three courses and several others that have been added since then constitute a graphic design curriculum of sorts for undergraduate students with no previous background and with diverse majors. Um, here is a picture of me uh, uh, teaching on campus. We're outside looking at uh, plaques around the building, uh, talking about the typography. Um, all of this was, of course, not in any way done by myself alone. Um, Alice Chung started teaching there at the same time. Danielle Aubert was there soon afterwards. Francesca Carassi, Laura Coons, Laurel Schulz, David Sellers, Peter Kazantsev, um, Nathan Carter, and Murray the Friedman all were essential to developing graphic design and inform at Princeton. Um, well, in 2016, uh, Inventory Press, which is Shannon Harvey and Adam Michaels, approached me and they 
had a little bit, they knew a little bit about what I was teaching at Princeton and they had the idea that uh, some of that subject, some of that material might be applicable to a larger audience. And they proposed uh, making a book around the teaching that I'd been doing there. Um, We together hatched a plan that it would be nicer to not write a straightforward book. Uh, I couldn't imagine doing that from the lectures um, as to kind of write it down seemed to kill it. And if there's anything, what's particularly satisfying about teaching is the way in which the material is alive when you're dealing with it. And so we hatched an alternate plan, which was instead of to uh, write a book, rather to speak the book. And so we conceived of shifting the kind of context from the uh, from Princeton, New Jersey to uh, Silver Lake in Los Angeles, California. And at the time, Midori Press had a had their offices in this building, a pretty spectacular uh, mid-century modernist uh, building designed. It was the offices of Richard Neutra. We uh, we used a space within there to set up three days of events. Each day was six 45-minute lectures that I would give with 15-minute breaks in between punctuated by, as it turns out, by uh, modular synthesizer music and by fresh juice. Um, each, so each day was six lectures, 45 minutes long. Each day compressed one semester length course into, uh, into that day. Uh, everything in those, so here, I'm going to show a couple pictures. Here is uh, me in the setup. We took uh, considerable care in kind of staging the setup. It was in a gallery space that was part of the Deutsche Office's buildings. Um, everything and the attendees for those three days were a mix of students from several uh, schools in Los Angeles area, some of whom were uh, uh, committed to coming by their school and others who came of their will. Um, everything in those three days was recorded, video recorded. Um, and that footage was after the fact, cleaned up, posted, transcribed, edited by Eugenia Bell and Adam Rickles, amended, and then it eventually got, became the text of the book that I showed at the beginning. So here we see the first day, uh, and this is an image from the second day. I guess what's useful to know is that the, the atmosphere was a bit of a, had a bit of kind of carnival or circuits to it. Uh, there are always several things going on. It was fairly casual. At the same time, those who were attending, it was a marathon. And I pity the poor individuals who came all three days and sat through six 45-minute lectures every day, but they did. And all of this was uh, towards the goal of producing the book. Okay. Um, I'm going to play a little excerpt of that recorded video. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and make sure that I've turned on the audio and the yes, I have. Okay. So now I'll go back to share. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to play a little bit of this. Uh, video. This was a introduction I gave each of the three days, uh, and I'll just play it. it. It indicates what's to come after. So, this is an experiment. That's that's the first thing to know. And you all, everybody here, is part of this experiment. It's kind of a maybe a harebrained idea to perform a book rather than writing a book. And so we uh, we came up with the premise that these three days would then, uh, each one covers one course at Princeton and the, they're being filmed and that will be transcribed and that forms the basis for a graphic design textbook. So uh, what, we're do what you hear in this room today is actually writing a book in the future. Okay. So uh, that was during, that was uh, at Guinea Beach class. And you see here, this is a spread from the book. Um, and you can read in the introduction a transcript of what I just said there. This is an experiment. That's the first thing to know. And everybody here is a part of it. 
Uh, it's maybe an airbrained idea to perform a book rather than write one, but here it is. Each of the next three days will cover one of my graphic design courses at the university, etc. All of this will be video recorded and transcribed to form the basis of the new publication so that what's said here now is also writing a book elsewhere in the future. Okay, I'm going to... And I play, uh, I'm going to flip through the spreads of that book here, of the book here on screen, just to give some idea of the texture of it. Um, whenever I flip the book, it, it plays a certain uh, kind of synthesized soundtrack, so you just have to bear with me. That gives you a, an idea of the kind of, it's a mix of uh, transcribed lectures that cover a pretty wide field, expanded notion of graphic design. Um, all right. So, you know, now I'm going to exit out of the, uh, exit out of the keynote. You can see, you know, here behind me, they're setting up in the past for, for those series of three days. Um, if you look carefully, you'll see me in the past behind me over my shoulder, or oh, that ruins the effect. But anyway, now now we've arrived in the future that was that I described at the beginning of the uh, each day, and which is printed in the book. Um, and it's been two years since it was published, published in 2019. And of course, it's, uh, lots have happened has happened in the meantime that we would not have predicted then. Of course, there's been a pandemic, and, and we're in the midst of and teaching. My own teaching, was, which was originally transposed from New Jersey to Los Angeles, has since been transposed to, a, to my studio on the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan. And I've been teaching, I was teaching remote for a year and a half, um, live streaming on Zoom, just like where I'm sitting right now. All right, so I, I was teaching remote live stream on Zoom from where I'm sitting right now. And this is the future that's arrived. Turns out the future is not what was, you know, not what we were seeing there in the past. The future looks a lot more like this, like a, it's a small basement on the Lower East Side, uh, which doubles as my studio and also served for a time as uh, my classroom. We all are intimately familiar with this. We're living with it right now. I think it's a particular, particularly kind of funny uh, coincidence or a uh, uh, confluence of, um, of ideas all at one time. So I thought maybe the best way to give a sense of uh, the book is to read at a maybe at a bit at a bit of an accelerated rate one of the lectures um, from the uh, from the book, and uh, it should be about fifteen minutes. You know, so it turns out the the one I want to very pick to share today. Is, is about a older than 20 year project and about design and how things change, which is something I'm often thinking about in my work um, and something I like it when projects address uh, how things might change uh, or gracefully adapt when they do change. So I'm gonna share my screen again, we'll go back to the keynote. So like I said, this, this won't be terribly long. Um, and I'm going to read at an accelerated space uh, pace. This is a lecture that uh, that I is in the interface class, which is the advanced graphic design class. The, the book is organized in three chapters. Interface, the third class, is the third chapter. The name of this uh, this talk is Touch Start to Begin. So this is a case study of an interface designed over 20 years ago and still in use today, fundamentally unchanged. This is a project I worked on, so it will have some personal detail. Uh, this is the beginning of it. Yeah. Uh, we start in 1995. It's a long time ago. I just started working at IDEO San Francisco for uh, Bill Modridge, a founder of IDEO, product designer. IDEO was a product design firm but around that time, they'd moved into the new practice of interaction design. Uh, I'd worked for a couple of years in New York, and I'd heard about what was going on at IDEO, and it sounded exciting, and I managed to get a job there as an interaction designer, and I moved to California. 
uh, 12 years before that, in 1983, Moggridge had designed this laptop computer, the Grid Compass. Uh, laptops were novel, and as I understand it anyway, when, when Moggridge began to live with the machine, he soon learned that the bulk of his attention was based on the screen, not on the product itself. And he had worked on the product itself, but not been able to design screen graphics. The physical design of the product was good, but the interface was where the action was. This epiphany led, at least in part, led to developing interaction design. Yeah. By 1995, when I arrived, the discipline was established. It fairly new. Okay, this is a New York City subway token. Uh, it's also from 1995. The token came from a clerk in a subway station booth, like this person. Uh, 1995. You walked up to the booth, you stuffed your dollar under the window and said, one. A token was returned and that, and that token then put into a slot in the turnstile, which lets you enter the subway. It was fast, it could be a bit gruff, but it was definitely efficient. Um, at the time, the MTA, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, who runs the New York City subways, was moving away from tokens and would soon introduce the MetroCard, a magnetic swipe stored value system for fare payment. The MetroCard uses card readers built into turnstiles to validate transactions. Although you could also buy your, your MetroCard from the token booth, the MTA would soon offer an electronic vending machine for purchasing a MetroCard via touchscreen interface. The new machine would eventually make the token booth redundant. There'd still be a clerk there to manage questions and problems and hand out maps, but most of the cards were meant to be sold through the machine. The MTA had been working on this project for a while already, but the machine was delayed. The job was commissioned at Cubic Westinghouse, a defense and public transportation contractor based in San Diego, who was already building turnstiles and station furniture for the MTA. And you might imagine that the Cubic Westinghouse didn't have a great deal of experience or design nuance necessarily for the electronic user-facing aspects of its new machine, which, facilitated, which facilitates a rather complicated transaction. Uh, design for screens was also relatively crude, and computer interfaces were not nearly as ubiquitous as they are now. To get an idea of that context in 1995, Google was not even a glimmer of an idea yet. It was in rough uh, prototype stage. Um, and a web browser like Netscape version 1.0 looked like this here tuned into the Google search engine prototype page. Um, although Cupid Westinghouse had the design build contract to both design the new MetroCard machines and also manufacture them, they'd not produced a convincing prototype. At what seems to have been the last minute, the MTA called in IDO, who was already known for this kind of work, product design, interaction design, projects that merged the two. The MTA is a large government agency with stretched budgets and the fees reflected this. The project timeline was very short. This is not a typical IDO commission. I was young, I guess 25, and I had just moved from New York and recognized the potential of this project to have a mass impact. Uh, industrial designer Masamichi Udagawa was much more experienced, he, but he, was also, he also immediately saw the potential when we started to work on this project together. I expect the condensed timeline and relatively low fees must have been part of the reason why I was put on the project, um, or just putting enthusiasm. Uh, IDEO had previously designed a touchscreen interface to the London Underground, so I soon left for IDEO's London office to learn from its designer, Kathleen Holman, and to work on this new interface. Meanwhile, Masamichi moved to New York to establish IDEO New York. Uh, exiled between my desk and the London attic space in Masamichi's New York apartment, the project moved ahead in relative isolation, which it turns out to be good for it. Before IDEO, Masamichi was working as an industrial designer at Apple or other places, where he designed a series of PowerBook laptops and other projects. He was more seasoned and already independently equated with complex hardware software design problems. He directed the project as the lead designer, lead industrial designer. I followed his direction with my work focused on the interface. Um, before the project was complete and the machines installed four years later, Masamichi, together with uh, Sugi Moslinger, his uh, working partner, established Antenna Design. Here's Masamichi and Sugi. A uh, product and interaction design studio that has since made exceptional work for clients, including the MTA, Noel, Rupert, I'd imagine they're quite familiar to many of you who watch this. Uh, they've designed everything from trains to screens to furniture. Um, anyway, here's a picture of them sometime closer to now. Um, meanwhile, my first real design job prior to IDO was in New York at 212 Associates, a graphic design firm 
that had worked on early touchscreen, an early touchscreen interface for Citibank ATMs, which was quite successful and distinct. Um, that project was led by studio principal Sylvia Harris, who you see on the left here, the IG analyst. Um, together with classmates David Gibson and Juanita Dugdale. Uh, together with, with David, Juanita, and Sylvia Harris formed 212 Associates as the graphic design studio, whose explicit focus was large public design projects. Um, although I didn't get to work on the Citibank uh, ATM interface project, the office was an exceptionally nurturing environment, and I was able to observe uh, Harris and others, uh, David Peters, worked uh, at work on the project. The Citibank ATM that resulted was a first-person interface um, addressing the user directly. The, the interaction started with uh, this. It started with, hello, may I help you? Which was radically different than what existed in ATM interfaces or any computer interface at that time. After addressing the user directly, um, it then continued to guide the user through the banking process. Confirming each step along the way, it was an example of good, clear public interface design. Now, this doesn't look very surprising. This language is maybe not surprising at all to us now, but it was pretty radically different than what existed at the time. Uh, when we started to work on the MetroCard automated vending machine project, a sequence of screens was already in place. We began by questioning that order and considering alternatives in the flow. So here's the spec document which came from Cubic Westinghouse in starting the, the project. Uh, the user paths or the flows were complicated, and there were a number of possible transactions that the new machine would implement, including buying a multi-ride card, a single ride ticket, adding value to an existing card, and even trading in consolidated cards. So this is from the initial spec document, which indicated what it needed to do. A primary goal for the metric card interaction was to make the transaction as efficient as possible. Buying a token was a quick, scripted maneuver. I mean, it was kind of like ballet underground where at the speed and grace at which you would get their token and get it, buy it, put it in the thing, get it in the subway. Uh, it was something you did over and over again. So we, so we set out several competing conceptual models for how the touchscreen interface would work. Um, these are listed in a drawing, in a drawing, this drawing. Okay, so I'm going to describe those four different conceptual models for the interface. Uh, the first model is just the existing flow. So that's number one. That's what was given to us. Number two was based on a kind of parking meter interaction where the user first inserts a card and then adds value to it um, or a parking lot. Um, number three was the vending machine, which you can think of like a snack or soda vending machine. The first thing you do when you walk up to the machine is insert money. Then you choose your item, your potato chips, Fritos, whatever. Press, press the button, and out comes what you bought. Done. Uh, the final model was more was a more elaborate transaction based on a bank machine interface, ATM. We called it the ATM, and in that interaction, you walk up to the machine, and it says, "Oh, do you want to do something? Put in your card. Okay, now type in your pin, and it continues. Now here are the things you can do today, and you choose one option, press the button." The interface confirmed. Do you want to do that? You confirm yes. The interaction continues guiding the user step by step through the process with confirmations at each decision point along the way. This is a considerably longer transaction process, um, but it turns out also quite reassuring. Um, after identifying these interaction models, we began to arrange the existing flow of screens provided by the MTA to match these different approaches. Uh, this is a drawing from that process. Uh, large sheets of paper. Um, the drawings were then passed back to the MTA to review, and these were adjusted, new flows resubmitted. It was an iterative process. Uh, this is a working drawing. We uh, eventually cleaned these up, typeset them, then passed them back again and again. And the process went back and forth with Masamichi uh, handling all the contact and directing our work, but it was re also remarkably, it was remarkably efficient. Uh, this was likely helped by the fact that we had one principal advocate at the MTA. And uh, uh, that was Sandra Bloodworth in the Arts for Transit. Uh, we converted these flows into two software prototypes to, to match the vending machine and ATM interaction models that the a MTA then put in front of a small group of users. Okay, so overwhelmingly, 
So we had models for the existing flow, for the parking lot, for the um, vending machine, and for the ATM. And we were overwhelmingly users respond to the ATM interaction model. This is exactly the opposite of what I thought would work, but go figure. Um, the new vending machine was somehow confusing, it was certainly new to these users. Now I thought the vending machine, the vending machine, the quick one, where you walk out, put in your money, get your thing, and leave. I thought for sure that was the way to go. It'd be faster, more immediate, cleaner, uh, more legible, I thought. But, but it turns out I had totally the wrong instinct. Now I guess that the novelty of this transaction, an interaction model that guided a user through a process, spoke directly to the user, addressed them directly. And confirmed each step along the way was both more understandable and also, importantly, more comfortable. So we proceeded with the ATM approach. Um, the, and the let me show these are just a couple of pages of sketches developing from those models to actually working on the screen uh, layout that supported those those flows. Uh, the user base was extraordinarily wide. People using it for the first time. People using the machine for the five thousandth time. People visiting New York, young people, old people, in all sorts of conditions, speaking many languages. The interface needed to be absolutely direct. The touchscreen was also small, constrained at 832 by 624 pixels, which is tiny, which is like an Apple Watch. And so in terms of actual number of pixels, this screen was physically the size that it's now. The, uh, there was a lot to fit in, and a quick idea for the screen layout up here where the horizontal, horizontal bands could house the different kinds of information. So let me show a detail from one of the sketches. So we thought like we thought like horizontal bands across to hold the different kinds of information the screen needed would be a scalable way to do this. So uh, those bands were regulatory, like what rules are in effect, um, status, where you are in the process, um, instruction, what to do next, like the direct address, uh, and global, like system-wide options like cancel or language. By placing these in consistent locations, we hope that this might ground the, ground the experience. The horizontal only division of screen real estate also indicated the kind of direction of the interface. Okay. The central graphic idea of the interface then emerged from this layout. A uh, strong yellow instruction bar moves from top to bottom down the interface as the Metro card transaction progresses. So you see that bar here is colored in black. Uh, the bar addresses the user directly, like that Citibank interface with clear instructions. Uh, below the bar is the active selection area, like what you could choose, comprised of a series of buttons for equivalent choices. Above the bar is status, what the user has already selected. Conceptually, the bar is the present, the present moment. Below the bar is the future, and above the bar is the past. At the end of the, the transaction, um, the bar gets to the bottom of the screen and then says thank you, wipes the screen from top to bottom, returning back to a kind of clean slate and touch start, says touch start to begin. The physical hardware was already configured to accommodate the components it needed to, including the touch screen, when the project started, but it was not yet detailed and so allowed some flexibility. Masumichi was uh, tasked with the, uh, was designing the hardware. And uh, he immediate, we immediately had ideas about ways to merge the software and the hardware together to blur the line between the two. This was already common practice at IDEO at the time. Uh, and we imagine that what happens on screen could be color coded to the related physical areas of the machine was designing, including cash entry, credit card swipe, receipt printing, and measure card delivery. So this kind of merging of software and hardware fell under the rubric at IDEO of hardware software integration. And it was uh, uh, consistent theme of the projects at the time. Um, okay, so here we had an idea that the areas of the machine would be color-coded as kind of strongly as possible and bright in relatively primary simple colors. And when those parts of the machine are calling for focus, then the instruction bar would change that color as well. So when the on-screen bar delivered instructions, its background color would shift to correspond to the area of the machine that you touch or use at that part of the process. So if, the, if it instructs the user to take your metric card, then the bar is yellow and matches the yellow area where your metric card comes out. Or when it asks you to insert cash, the bar is green, matching the green bill acceptor machine. 
There is also already an existing graphic language for the interface. No compelling reason to depart from that. In 1970, Vignelli Associates designed a robust system for the MTA, which we know uh, is still being used today. We worked directly from the MTA graphic standards manual, and it laid out our choices pretty unambiguously. Uh, the machine also needed to be another important criteria, which we took seriously from the beginning, was that the machine needed to be uh, accessible. The Americans with Disabilities Act was relatively new at the time, but it provided and it provided some guidance, but we needed more. And so we turned to the Lighthouse, an organization for partially sighted people uh, that advocates accessibility in public spaces. Working with the Lighthouse New York office, uh, we learned some surprising things about the uh, population of partially sighted people in the city. An extremely small percentage read Braille. There are many shades of sightedness, and to call somebody blind or not, it's a threshold rather than a binary reckoning. Uh, most people have at least some vision, and there are certain choices which particularly help legibility. I feel like all of this is much more clearly on the radar now than it was 20 years ago in design for screens. Uh, one of the most important was contrast. Uh, size was also quite important. We decided to use these two criteria, kind of like the MTA graphic standards, as like generators for the graphic design of the thing. So color was also useful in distinguishing between colors was quite possible with impaired sight. Um, so we made further, so we, we paid particular attention to these. Okay, here's an early prototype of a screen layout. It, there are several versions before this, but this gets closer to what it eventually looks like. Uh, we made further software models and put these again in front of users, which is coordinated by the MTA. This is a fairly early version of the interface, and you can see the bars coming down the screen. You can choose, uh, here you can choose select Metro card value and choose any one of those uh, buttons below it. Uh, you can, so here is, here is the screen. Okay. Uh, from this prototype, which we made as a kind of course um, stepping through prototype, which people click through on screen, users click through on screen, um, from this prototype, we learned at least one very immediate and visceral response. That was the buttons don't have quite buttons. So these things below, which are choices, 3, 6, 15, 30, 60, uh, they didn't look enough like buttons. At this time, buttons were big, glowing, three-dimensional things. Uh, that's the way that we understood them on screen. Um, today, we're a bit, maybe a bit more sophisticated about this. Anyway, this seemed like a completely reasonable critique. And, uh, and something, a good bit of information to develop the next version from. So I started a bunch of graphic studies to work out how to make a button that would look more like a button, but also remain historically graphic. Uh, I didn't want it to date itself too quickly. And I wanted it to be coherent with the rest of the interface. Or we did this with all aspects of the project, but this is just one little detail. Uh, I was reluctant to make floating buttons that glow when pressed. That was common at the time. Um, these studies, which you see here, kind of imagine three-dimensional consequences of certain graphic two-dimensional choices. Uh, the, drawings, the drawing reminds me that interface design trades heavily in metaphor. And so choices for how an object in the interface looks has corresponding implications for what the object is supposed to be. And so therefore, how it should behave. The eventual winner uh, is a pretty subtly shaded button here, which we see up at the top, uh, which is two different colors of of uh, uh, articulation around the white outline. Uh, okay, I want to show you uh, right now, I'm going to take you through a slightly more developed, oh, pretty closely, closely developed uh, version of the interface almost where we got to at the end. Um, okay, so this is a an evolved version. Um, here, you walk up the screen, it says touch start to begin. That only arrived after we did a couple prototypes and people didn't know that you needed to actually, it said touch screen to begin. And people were confused by that. By putting an actual button in a hit location, like what to touch, that made it much clearer. It says start up here on the screen. As you move down the interface, the yellow bar moves down the screen. People who have used the interface in New York will recognize this. People who have not, um, that's why I'm sharing this. Okay, so please select MetroCard type. You're addressed as to what to do. Uh, and MetroCard, Metro Pass, which was an idea that did not make it through to the end, but and single ride uh, card. Then please select transaction. And you'll notice what happens is everything that's below the yellow bars in the future, when you've made a choice, 
things that you've selected are in the past, and those appear above the yellow bar. Um, okay, add value, get new card, traded cards. And then what amount you want, you choose it. And when you pick that one, it goes up to the top as well. Uh, please pay, put in your money, take your Metro card. Do you want a receipt? And then it wipes and it begins again. And that's, that's the interface. Now, we, we took that interface and we combined it with a hardware uh, prototype model. So throughout the interface design ladder, decisions were simple and modular enough that they, they might be able to be added to and changed. Uh, this was important. I'm going to go back to this slide, something like this. Uh, this was important uh, because over time, the interface would need to evolve. You need to add new languages, new dollar amounts, new sequences, new kinds of products, whatever. So I figured if the design was blunt, simple, even coarse, like it looked huge at the time, maybe it doesn't anymore, uh, then it would also be more flexible in the future rather than kind of designing it down to the finest detail. To this end, the type size was huge um, and colors were kept uh, simple. Screen layout was not fussy and the graphic devices that pulled the interface together were simple enough that additional demands on the language or sequence or even function would not destroy its like overall gestalt. Uh, six months in, so six months in, we arrived at a physical prototype um, together with an interactive demo. Uh, the model was skeletal, only a front face rendered in fiber by us, and only certain parts of the interface would go out in software. Uh, that model was staged in an anonymous tower, uh, 30 floors up in midtown Manhattan, where a testing coordinator, this gentleman, uh, led approximately 30 people through the steps of using the prototype machine. Um, here's the front of that uh, prototype. Well, we read it a touch screen to wire into the demo, which you see here, but predictably it didn't work. And so we ended up having to, uh, well, we, first of all, also the monitor did it in line up to the place we needed. So we stacked it on reams of paper. Uh, and because the touch screen didn't work, Masamichi sat where the mouse, where the table with the mouse is and clicked while people pushed the relevant places on the screen. Now, apparently, the illusion was convincing, and the feedback was pretty conclusive. We didn't change too much after that. Um, here's a view from behind a two-way mirror in that space. Um, in the meantime, the project uh, finished for me, my involvement in it. I went back to graduate school in 1997. Uh, I delivered a folder of final pick graphic assets and comprehensive layouts for each of the screens. And the Met MetroCard vending machine went back to Cubic Westinghouse for the next two years to code the software and build the hardware. Uh, meanwhile, I continued to struggle through graduate school, passing thoughts about the project and hearing an occasional update from Masamichi, who was on top of it, uh, whose new firm continued to work with the MTA. By 1999, the, the machines were ready, and the first was installed at the 68th Street Hunter College Station on January 26, 1999. Here in 1999. Um, it appeared in the New York Times that day. Here's an image of it being carried down the stairs. And I went to go see the finished machine, and to use it, um, I was absolutely shocked. The interface design was largely intact. It was very much how it was sent and designed. I mean, very close. The finished product was almost exactly what we sent, and it was good. I was really happy. Um, since the first machines were installed, the interface has evolved, but the graphics stayed the same. Sequence of adjusted, sequences of adjusted, words changed, functions were added and removed, but the interface remains in use at the time of grading. The pro this project confirmed my strong belief about thinking through how what you're designing will change over time, knowing that it will, and trying to design that knowledge into the solution. Here's a receipt from the first day. Uh, meanwhile, radio frequency, RFID, um, contact payment, payment tickets, and using your phone have just have been introduced in New York, and the MetroCard machine itself will be phased out Soon enough, it'll take a while. Um, still, 20, more than 20 years is a pretty long run for an interface. Um, one last screen taken the other day uh, in 2021, uh, a defunct um, Metro card machine, temporarily no bills accepted, no credit cards accepted, no debit cards accepted, and I guess you could continue. Anyway. Um, okay, that's... That's the end of that, and I will stop sharing my screen. All right.
Thank you so much, David, for that presentation of a chapter of a lecture of your book. I wanted to go back to that process for speaking the book into existence, I guess. And it seems like it was something that you wanted to do to make sense or um, to sort of reflect the way that you teach. But could you tell us more about that choice? And do you think it's something um, that you've kind of started a new subgenre or created a new hybrid form there? Uh, yeah, it's a definite choice. It was a definite choice. Um, it, it, it comes out of, uh, it's not, uh, it's not intended to like suggest a new genre of doing this, but it was a good way to, uh, upset any expectations I would have about what the book would sound like or be like. And, uh, it's just strange enough and it sounded fun to do also. And it, it wasn't because it was going to be fun, but, it, but, in being exciting, then I have a feeling some of that would carry through to material. And so it's just like, I think it's kind of like how I want to approach teaching, which is always to keep it as lively as possible. I think it's important to keep it lively as possible for myself as well as for any students. Yeah. You can only take one half of the equation, it doesn't work so well. Right. Yeah, speaking of lively, so you write in the book, but you've also said this in other talks, encouraging folks to burn the book after they read it. And I know it's a little bit tongue in cheek, um, but I think there's something there about the book as an artifact of stories and a delivery vehicle, but also just as something that's like a moment in time, right? That you're not trying to necessarily put like cast something in lead or bronze or amber and add to the canon. In that sense, it's just your point of view uh, of these stories. Can you tell us more about that provocation there? Yeah, I do say at the end of the introduction, so that I said this each of the first three days, and it's you know, printed in a book, I say, yeah, it's, it's an apology of sorts, uh, but it's also the, the essence of the book, which is, uh, this is, you know, this is not intended to be any sort of canon of graphic design history. It's completely partial and guided by whatever I'm interested in, not by a... a it, anyway, and so it's, but it should serve as something more like a model for a prompt for other people to do the same thing, to build up your own set of references, you know, to build up your own constellation of things that you're interested in that'll keep you moving. You know, it's like, it's too easy to get caught up in what other people think. And uh, I feel like in design in particular, you need some sort of like uh, momentum behind you. To keep to keep things moving. So, and actually, I'm completely serious about burning the book. Burn the book, and, buy, and then buy another one. Yeah, buy one for a friend. Here's my copy here, by the way. So, one more question before I turn it over to an audience member, Jenny, who has her hand raised and is being quite patient. I'm curious about the title. You call it a new program for graphic design, but having read through the book, it's not necessarily, there are assignments that you give at the end of each section, but it's not necessarily a traditional textbook or a curriculum even in that sense. It also had me thinking of program in the sense of computer programs, since you also deal with software and code. So can you tell us more about the choice of the word program in your title? Yeah, um, it definitely is intended to have uh, several meanings. I mean, to be fun in that way. Uh, I mean, I definitely like. I like that it refers to computer programming. It's that's something that's part of what I do and part of what I uh, find relevant to graphic design. Um, but it uh, it is also, of course, referring to a uh, a program of sorts, a kind of collection of classes, things that you could study your way through, and. Uh, um, the title is a variation on a on an earlier title that we a working title that we had, and we just kind of eased into this just by tossing the the names around between Jen and Adam and myself. And anyway, yeah. So program, yeah, the pun is intentional. The uh, the new is in asterisk. You might notice on the title from the cover, and that's in a way. Uh, and to to make some of the authority out of it, I suppose, I it's supposed to be a bit of a wink. Like it's not really new. It's nothing new. Right. <laughs> uh, looks like I lost the hand from the audience member with a uh, question. So, if you 
are still here, please do raise your hand again. I can let you uh, speak on mic. But anybody else, you're also welcome to type in the chat or type in the Q&A if you have a question for David. I'm happy to ask your question for you too if you're feeling a little shy or if you can't go on mic right now. In the meantime, I'll just keep on talking with David uh, while we wait for some audience questions. I also wanted to come back to this theme of your approach to graphic design as a liberal art. And Ellen Lupton writes about it in the foreword to your book, talking about graphic design as the infrastructure of history, which uh, she touches upon, and you have examples of that in the book. Can you tell us more about that, how that approach, especially teaching in a place like Princeton, kind of fits in with the liberal arts college format versus maybe strictly a, a trade school or a kind of vocational training approach to graphic design? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is to do with context. It's like what else the students are studying, and so they're studying a wide range of other um, uh, of other subjects, right? It could be they might be studying economics and uh, German literature, and, and uh, you know, who knows what else? Engineering, maybe. Um, and so, anyway, it's uh, it's the context there that that in some ways makes it. Uh, relevant. So it's one amongst many things that you're studying. I also think, I mean, I know this applies to me. I think design, graphic design often uh, collects generalists. People are interested in lots of things or dilettantes, maybe less <laughs> way to say it. I'll, I'll, I'll take that term, no problem. Uh, people like to, you know, explore different areas and, and learn a bit about it. And I find that broad a broad approach uh, really uh, convincing for design. Uh, and I think that's because uh, it doesn't reward over-professionalization, over I don't think, because it relies on having new ideas, and new inputs, and new people. And so uh, I think to keep it loose, uh, it helps to have a broad set of your own interests. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered it really. Okay. No, I think it really does. Um, I think it's a, it's a really big topic where right? we could do a whole hour just talking about design as liberal art. Uh, we have Jessica in the comments saying absolutely is a liberal art. Uh, John in the comments um, wants to say hello. Thinks this is wonderful stuff. Very much enjoyed the MTA interface story. Uh, his question is, what, if anything, has been the most critiqued of your approach or point of view regarding design, and how have you responded? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, let me think about it for one second. Um, I certainly have been. And, uh, uh, most critiqued. Um, well, I think, uh, I think I've... Uh, Let's see. Well, here's one strange thing. Okay, in classes, I'm showing, like, not always, this is certainly not always the case, but here's one example of a project I worked on that I'm showing students. And this is uncomfortable territory because you're in a, a position of authority and you're up at the front of the class. I mean, I'm always trying to evacuate in one way or the other, whether it's like sitting amongst the students or, or having other people lead the class or. But either way, it's unavoidable. You're the you're the teacher. So when you show your own words, your whatever you're showing becomes exemplary, and that is a problem, right? And particularly with my own limited kind of background and set of references, that that problem is escalated. And so I think uh, I deserve to be criticized for that. At the same time, I feel I've always been most convinced by teachers I've had who are very upfront about what they do. And who share their work? Uh, I find that you have such a close connection to it. You could speak with more depth about why it exists. You're not just repeating what somebody else has said about a third person's work. And so, I think this is a complicated equation. But anyway, it's uh, it's something uh, I've been criticized for. I'm very aware of, and uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, that's that's the case. Um, right. Yeah, I think there's an inherent tension in design education that's not necessarily solvable in that as a, a teacher, you want to show your work and be a model in some sense, but you don't want to create mini-me's, oh, yeah. students who, who want to become the next you or who imitate you too specifically, right? And want them to maybe find their own voice and find their own point of view. But that's, that's always there as a tension that's just inherent to the profession. Yeah, that's true. 
So another design re- does design education related question. Bonnie wants to know if you could change one thing about undergraduate graphic design education, what would it be? Well, I don't have that. I mean, I've taught a number of places. Princeton is the only place I've taught undergraduate. Um, I always taught, I taught in graduate programs before that. So I don't have a very broad view of undergraduate graphic design education with a narrow view. Um, so, um, uh, um, I guess uh, I guess I I would love to to see programs where you can uh, programs maybe within universities where you can study lots of different things and go off and kind of follow your impulses uh, rather than um, art schools which have their own uh, own significantly positive aspects but uh, don't often allow you access to the same level of outside courses so i don't know more uh, university settings for uh, graphic design programs that, that could be something i could wish for all right um erica from linkedin has a question do you have any advice for students or aspiring designers today about how to break into the industry um uh let's see uh i think uh i think the the best first the best first step this is this is actually practical it may not sound like it but figuring out exactly what you, what draws you into design yourself and being really clear about that uh, even to the point of writing it down trying to like you know wrestle with it a bit like what is it about graphic design that drew you in to do this and what you want to keep doing it and do you want to keep doing it for thirty years. Um, these are all good questions to ask yourself at the beginning. And I think the clearer you get on those things and the more articulate you can, the, the better you can articulate what it is that draws you into it, the more people might uh, give you a chance to, to exercise that. You know, it's like people are not interested in a designer. You need to come in with a point of view. I think you'll get a better reception. And, uh, but you need to figure out that point of view. And it's not so immediate when you just like studied and heard 20 different points of view. Yeah, that's a great point about finding and articulating your why as a designer, your point of view. Uh, we're getting like inundated with questions now that we're running out of time. So we'll try to get to as many as uh, possible, but it's great to have this much audience engagement. Uh, back specifically to the MTA MetroCard project, Ben wants to know, why do the receipts fade so easily? Why, like, why do they so fade? Like, <laughs> heat thermal transfer printing, I think. I think that's the actual answer. Is this just the printing process? Uh, I don't know further than that, but I love that they fade. But I have that one that was the final, the final screen, uh, which was from 1999, which is kind of a bit of a treasure. <laughs> Wonderful. Do you know when they're officially phasing out the Metro cards? I don't know. No. All right. No official timeline yet, it seems, or not public? Not that I, not, not that I know. Yeah. So. Uh, Peter in the chat wants to know about your opinion of the evolution or branching off of UX UI um, from graphic design, certainly since 1995 with this project where UX UI is almost, there's different on-ramps to those sort of careers, right? Not, um, even if some of the early folks um, did come from graphic design backgrounds, that's not necessarily the case anymore. So do you have any thoughts on that sort of branching off or divergence? Uh, I guess it's, uh, I don't have positive or negative thoughts necessarily. Like I think a lot of the skills, many of the skills that come up, but certainly not all of them. And just, you know, with the important, you know, the centrality of like user, the like UX UI work right now with its kind of massive cultural import, you know, importance, then it seems, I'm not surprised it's branched off. Right. It's just simply like, uh, uh, graphic designer would not be a big enough tent to uh, house all of that new specialist knowledge, which has to do with how things are sequenced and users and other things that just aren't part of our uh, conventional like, house of knowledge. So I don't feel good or bad about it. I just think it's a thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a healthy approach, I guess. Um, Munis, I hope I'm saying your name right. Munis um, in the Q&A wants to know, do you think that graphic design education is in a new era? Uh, this is related to what we've just been talking about. Uh, he adds, or he, 
they ask. A lot of the departments are in the interaction of design and technology. Uh, what's the novelty of a graphic design education versus media design education? Like what sets graphic designers apart, I guess, or graphic design education educated people apart at this point? I wonder if it's like a disciplinary body of knowledge, history, something like this, uh, or histories. Um, that might be what sets it off. And so graphic design has been able to like claim some 20th century uh, run of, uh, of disciplinary, discipline-specific uh, history and material and practitioners, the, the scope of which is incredibly narrow and, should, and, and many projects are working to make that a lot more wide in its scope, um, which is urgent, obviously. Um, but anyway, I think that's uh, maybe that's one thing is uh, graphic design has been a category a bit longer. So it has a, um, so it has a, a backstory that's a bit longer and a kind of orientation that maybe is perhaps more. Yeah. Than, uh, yeah. I'll just add a personal note to that as somebody who grew up around computers and has always designed digitally, I found in your book fascinating the historical stories about like typesetting and um, all of this sort of stuff that I had no idea how any of that stuff actually worked uh, right. before computers. And so just connecting the world that we live in now of mostly screen-based graphics, but also um, the continuation of print, but just realizing that these techniques have evolved and they go back back way before computers, I thought was fascinating to just be a part of that tradition, even if I've never actually worked in those media. Right. Yeah. All right. I think we have time for um, a couple more questions. Um, let's ask two at a time. One is what sparked your initial inspiration uh, to get into graphic design in the first place? And then what's inspiring you right now? Or what's one or two examples of what's inspiring you right now? Uh, may I take the first question first, which is what, what got me into it? Because I can... At least I think it was uh, one particular moment of sitting in a in a library at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, big state university where I went to undergraduate, and um, uh, seeing a book on the shelf which had uh, which was about like drafting pens, <laughs> and I thought I thought oh, that looks interesting. I started to look at it, started to understand it was about graphic design production. Thought that would all looked interesting and seemed to merge like uh, a kind of technical facility with. Uh, you know, being able to make things, creativity, and this aligned very closely with what I was already interested in and doing. I just didn't know the graphic design existed as a thing. So that was what kind of opened up, <laughs> made me think, oh, this is something I could do. It's something I really want to do. Uh, what's inspiring me now? Um, uh, thinking about that for one second. Um, uh, well, I, I guess I think. I've been inspired by the ways in which so many practices have reorganized themselves during the pandemic and uh, the way groups of people get together in different formats. And I'm no advocate of Zoom generally, um, but, uh, but I am certainly inspired by seeing how other people are kind of renegotiate the terms of, of doing projects and, organizing and getting together and doing events and these things. So that's, that's, uh, that's cool. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, David Reinford, thank you for joining us today to share about your book, a new program for graphic design. You all in the audience can get your own copies on artbook.com with AIG member 25 as the coupon code for 25% off. We'll see you at the next AIGA event. You can go to AIGA.org to learn more about our upcoming events, book events, and otherwise, or follow us on social media, AIGA Design, on all of the platforms. So thanks again, everybody, and see you next time. Bye. Thank you.